like everybody to stand up and do a seventh inning stretch, please. Stand up, seventh inning stretch, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now watch the slide. I want you to think about this. You can do two things at the same time. Stand and think. Is that possible? I'll leave this slide up there so you can think here. I'm going to ask you the question here. Looking at, let's look at the two largest sources of uh, CO2 in the, in the country. They are, they come, they are from transportation and uh, electricity. Since 1950, in other words, 60 years, the number one uh, item, uh, the number of transportation miles driven has increased by six and a half times. During that same 60 or so years, the amount of act, annual electricity generated has increased by 12 and a half times. Those are pretty substantial increases, right? So based on those large increases and what you've read and heard, how much do you think that the annual amount of man-made CO2 produced in the United States over the same 58-year time period would be have increased by? Would have been increased by? Okay, you can sit down. The answer, surprisingly, is only two times. An amazingly low percentage. These next three slides may be some of the most important ones I have to show. The first uh, explains the answer to the question I just asked. Note that how over a 60 year period that the United States CO2 emissions have gone up very slowly, particularly if you consider our much higher population, huge annual increase of electricity use, big upswing in annual mileage driven, etc. Also compare the US CO2 emission line to the rapidly increasing global CO2 line big difference. In 1950, we generated a large portion of the global CO2, about 43%. Today, not so much, about 19% and decreasing. I get two things from this. Number one, the United States is not the problem. And number two, what the United States has been doing in the last 50 years or so has been reasonably prudent. For instance, regarding transportation, the average new car on the road today runs 97% cleaner than the average car built in 1970, thanks to a combination of cleaner gasoline and more efficient engines. Regarding electricity, a large part of the CO2 reduction is due to nuclear energy. Don't forget, there were no nuclear energy facilities in 1950. As a point of reference, I've added one more relevant piece of data. The main global warming advocates are now pushing a number that their evangelist, Dr. James Hansen, came up with. To quote him, quote, the safe upper limit for atmospheric CO2 concentration is no more than 350 parts per million. He goes on to predict a series of disasters that, quote, extend far beyond extermination of species and future sea level rise, unquote. As the graph, show, the graph shows, we passed this disaster limit in 1988. Here's the future, as projected by the government and CO2 experts. Note again the United States line, and then compare it to the total worldwide line. It still seems to me the United States is not the problem, that the U.S. has passed into the future without wind power is quite reasonable. Another conclusion from this data, considering the magnitude of the global CO2 problem, is that no renewable can possibly make more than a tiny impact on global CO2. For example, the United States with wind power and without wind power projection part, 2008 to 2030, are actually two different lines. But there's so little difference that they're indistinguishable on the graph and it looks like one line. Note also the point where wind power started to be used worldwide the arrow up at the top there. Do you see any improvement in the graph slope from that time? In other words, the slope should have dropped down due to the benefits here. In other words, where is all the CO2 saved by the 100,000 plus turbines? Like it or not, the evidence says that immediate large-scale Im implementation of nuclear power is the only electrical power source with any hope of making a consequential CO2 difference. Are any of those messages what you've been led to believe by our environmental groups? Look, none of this is to say we can't do better. We, we can't have cleaner air, but we should be taking sensible actions in that direction. Another conclusion is that the government could try to force an enormous reduction of our CO2 emissions, let's say 25%. This would be an extraordinarily expensive, literally trillions of dollars, and cost massive environmental harm. 
This is essentially the foolish idea behind what's called cap and trade bill that was proposed. But even this huge amount of CO2 savings <coughs> would have a negligible effect on the global CO2 situation and could be immediately swamped out by several national, natural, for instance, volcanoes or man-made CO2 sources. And look closely at the Hanson Gore disaster line. It should be abundantly clear that nothing we do in this country will have any meaningful impact on global CO2. What we would have accomplished for such a huge expenditure and sacrifice? Very little. These graphs tell us that concepts of carbon neutral and clean, green, and free energy sound PC, but the reality is they do not make sense from a scientific, economic, and environmental perspectives. We do have serious energy issues, so we need to adopt meaningful environmental policies that are SC, scientifically correct. Think about this. We're often accused of having less than 5% of the world's population, but generate 20% of the CO2 emissions. Yet we seldom hear the other facts that we're responsible for 30% of the world's gross domestic product and 35% of the world's food. We feed, clothe, house, and protect the world, which anti-Americans are now turning against us to try to make us feel guilty. The agenda is to get us to penalize ourselves, plus for us to pay third world countries for our success. The major beneficiary here will be China. They are very happy that we are choosing to voluntarily handicap our economy. You can be quite sure that they won't be doing the same thing. Let me be very clear here. China is not our enemy, but they are our main competitor. So how can this possibly be? How can the United States be in a path to spend several trillion dollars on an electrical energy source that fails five out of six of our historically important power generation and has no independent scientific proof that even meets this new emissions criteria. The primary reason we're going down this wasteful path is no surprise. It's all about the money. Lobbyists for businesses and parties who want to have a piece of these trillions of dollars, like Mr. Pickens, are leaving no stone unturned. Some environmentalists have taken their eye off the ball and are promoting this palliative non-solution through ignorance. Politicians, eager to be seen as green, just a current fad, are saying yes to everything in the color of money. Green. I simply have to take a detour here for a minute. We throw this figure about casually these days, but how much is a trillion dollars? So we're going to use as an example $100 bills. That much is $10,000. That's a shipping pallet size, and that's $100 million. A billion. A trillion. Your stacks of $100 bills. Now that you get that, a second important reason we've lost our way is that politicians, environmentalists, and many scientists don't really understand this profoundly important equation, which says that one megawatt from one electrical source is not necessarily the same as one megawatt from another. The best way to understand what may seem to be a contradiction is to consider an analogy. Well, this makes sense, right? Let's say a company wants to hire someone to get some uh, job done. Is any one person equal to any other person to do that job? Of course not. They were different in the amount of work they could perform, their reliability, their dependability, their skill, their cooperativeness, their cost, etc. So it is with electrical sources, and that's the message of the six grid characteristics I went over. There are big differences. That's an underlying flaw in government policies pushing wind powers. One of their assumptions is that all sources are basically equal. Here's another way to look at it. Both sources average one megawatt, but are they the same? Well, on paper they are, but in the real world they're obviously extremely different. Hopefully you can see now why one megawatt electricity from a nuclear power plant is not the same as one megawatt electricity from a wind power project. Once you understand wind power's inherent electrical grid defects, it should hopefully also put in some other issues into perspective. For instance, it is entirely legitimate to be concerned about bird and bat mortality, noise intrusions, flicker effect, ice throws, other health issues, visual pollution, property devaluation, decommissioning, etc. But what if they were fixed 
mitigated is the word currently used. Of course, it doesn't necessarily mean fixed at all. To answer this important question, let's say that a conscientious town's ordinance is written to help with some of these issues and requires a one-mile separation of wind turbines from all houses, much more than developers want. So the question is, does this make wind power an acceptable source for providing us commercial electricity? By now, I hope you know the answer that this excellent regulation in no way addresses the fundamental electrical grid limitations of wind power we just identified. So the answer is no. Industrial wind power will not be acceptable until all seven criteria are met. Because that's not even close to happening, wind power is not a legitimate part of any serious energy solution. That said, there is a major benefit to getting such a citizen-friendly ordinance passed, and that is discourage these opportunists from coming to your community in the first place. The unfortunate tactic that several states, including Maine, are using is to force utility companies to use wind power, whether they like it or not and they generally don't. It's called a Renewable Portfolio Standard, which mandates an artificial percentage of renewables by some arbitrary date. This misguided edict is an abandonment of free market enterprise, which should be rather important to us. Not surprisingly, what happens here is that we subjects end up being imposed on financially and environmentally. An RPS is, is makes as much sense as an edict mandating that a certain percentage of our trucks and automobiles must be operated by horsepower in a few years. The justification would be that it would save a lot of fossil fuel emissions and create some jobs, which unlike wind power would actually be true. But consider the enormous consequences of such an arbitrary government mandate. For instance, if you had to use horsepower for transportation, everything in your life would change and very little of it would be good for you. We went away from horsepower to become a modern society. We abandoned wind power for exactly the same reasons. Now the government is telling us to go backwards, all due to lobbyists. Let's look a bit closer to see how amazingly biased and inaccurate the typical justification of the RPS is. I'll use New York as an example, but I'm sure it's very similar to Maine. The promoters have fabricated three supposed benefits of this artificial mandate. I've already shown how the environmental benefits are tiny. In fact, the 2008 study paid for by New York State, which was rigged to support it, concluded that New York State citizens are paying something like $20,000 for every dollar of environmental benefits. Remember that environmental benefits was initially the main justification for the RPS. Does that make any sense at all? Then there are supposed economic development benefits a community may get, primarily during the construction stage. The basis for this calculation is a computer model called JEDI. The computer model has several biased assumptions built into it, plus it ignores many negative economic consequences of wind power implementation. As an example, there have been numerous independent studies that have challenged the green jobs political assertions made by promoters of renewable energy. None of these considerations are dealt with by JEDI. When taking all this into account, the general economic development benefits to the citizens is likely to be zero. Some economists actually contend that it is negative. Same situation exists in Maine. Then there is the supposed largest benefit by far, 72%, called price suppression. I'll bet no one here has even ever heard of such a thing, price suppression, or certainly can't explain it very well. This will probably sound more complicated than it is, but the only reason I'm going through this is to give you a good idea how incompetent some state bureaucracies are. Each type of electric power, for instance hydro and nuclear, periodically bids, puts in a bid to supply a certain amount of electricity. They are then arranged in order of increasing price. Starting with the least expensive, the state then accepts as many bids as required to meet some needed amount. The amazing thing is, is that the selected suppliers do not get paid what they bid, but rather they all get paid the cost of the most expensive source used. Go to the online version of this presentation for more slides about this, plus the references needed to check it out. So the summary of this whole RPS fiasco is that New York State citizens are paying out some $2 billion, or almost nothing to show for it. But it is enriching multinational corporations. Since this RPS matter brings up another big question, what is a renewable? The word renewable is bandered about with a variety of meanings, but the main difference between a renewable and a non-renewable is its rate of replacement. But who's to say what is too slow? For instance, it has been estimated by experts that we may have enough nuclear fuel for 2,500 years. 
that the government doesn't choose to call nuclear for renewable. 